Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Machine Learning and Data Analytics in the Pandemic Era. I'm Elizabeth Heichler, Executive Editor of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's program is sponsored by SAS VIA. Our speakers today are Tom Davenport and Jeff Cam. Jeff is the Inmar Presidential Chair in Business Analytics, Associate Dean of Business Analytics, and Executive Director of the Center for Analytics Impact at the Wake Forest University School of Business. Tom is the President's Distinguished Professor of Information Technology and Management at Babson College, as well as a Fellow of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, a visiting professor at Oxford Said Business School, and a Senior Advisor to Deloitte's Analytics and Cognitive Practice. Um, in their July article for SMR, Tom and Jeff investigated the question, what happens to the data-driven approach to management when data itself is disrupted? As they pointed out, machine learning models make predictions based on past data, but there's no recent past like today's present. They'll discuss how data and analytics leaders have adjusted and how they are using these tools moving forward. Tom, Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, it's good to be with you. This is Jeff Cam speaking, and uh, Tom and I are delighted to be with you today. Thanks to Sloan for inviting us. Tom, if you want to say hello. Uh, yes, um, not my first um, webinar, but um, of all the webinars I've done with Sloan Management Review, this one is certainly the most recent. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm happy to be doing this with you, Jeff. Um, that is a first. So. Thanks, it's a pleasure. So uh, back in spring, Tom and I spent uh, some time speaking with analytics and data science uh, leaders about how the pandemic was impacting uh, what they do. And so what we'd like to do this morning is, is share with you some of the things that we found. And I think it is, it is very timely uh, in that we do unfortunately find ourselves uh, facing a situation now much like we faced maybe worse uh, back in the spring. And so, you know, an interesting question uh, that we don't have the answer to is uh, what have we learned in the spring that, and how are we going to take that and move forward in the fall now that we're in this, this second wave? Are we going to do better maybe than we did in the spring with regard to uh, data science and analytics? And uh, I think we're going to begin with a poll. And so how has the pandemic affected data about your business and markets? And you should have the opportunity uh, to participate in this poll. I think we're gonna launch that now. So no disruptions in data, minor disruptions in data, substantial disruptions in data. We have no idea what's going on and don't know, not sure. So the question is how many people will be brave enough to say, we have no idea what's going on in our organization uh, based on uh, the crazy data that we're, that we're getting. Yeah. And I think we, I think a number of people admitted that when we spoke to them in the spring, <laughs> that, that were, there was a shock to the system. Yeah, and the, as you were saying, Jeff, the good news is that our article and this webinar is still relevant. The bad news is that means the pandemic is um, not um, getting any better, in the US at least. I was on a call yesterday with Australia and they said no new cases in the new state of New South Wales where Sydney is. So that was something I envied. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I find myself on our data committee for our university, COVID data. And so uh, some of the things that we've heard, I've been living the last few weeks um, in terms of, you know, how can you really get a handle on trying to predict some of these uh, outbreaks? And it's not easy, that's for sure. Gentlemen, can you see the poll results? We, I can. Um, it, it looks like the um, two winners are minor disruptions and substantial disruptions. Uh, not too many people said they have no idea what's going on, only 6%, and um, uh, only 10% say they've had no disruptions whatsoever. So um, 
it's good, I guess, at least that there's some evidence of a problem or a challenge to address. So I guess we'll continue with this webinar. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have permission to go forward. <laughs> All right. Well, I thought we'd start by um, just trying to remember what happened. I mean, it's to me, you know, I've been working from home since March. I'm sure many of you have been. Uh, sometimes you have to pause. It seems like 10 years ago uh, that this hit. And so I thought I'd just run through, uh, you know, what were we experiencing back in March, February, March? And this is a slide that shows unemployment claims. And, and preceding this, uh, if you remember what was going on late February, early March, the last time I flew was in early March to give a talk. And uh, remember coming home, it was the end of the first week of March. And after that, it was sort of like we'd reached a point of no return. Starting around the third week of March, states started mandating stay-at-home orders California on March 19th, uh, Ohio March 23rd, uh, and then you know, roughly 30, 40 states over time between like the March 19th and the first week of April mandated stay at home orders. So we had this massive disruption to life in general. And, uh, you know, what is the impact? What impact had, did that have on the data that we've been using? Um, to create a claim, right? To plan and be more efficient and forecast better. And so that's what we want, really want to talk about. So the disruption really, really hit home, if you remember, in, uh, in March and took off from there. So this is uh, some data uh, from Amazon and uh, on just some different different product types here, beauty, apparel, footwear, and accessories. Uh, we talked to uh, folks at Haynes Brand uh, here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in the apparel sector. They certainly experienced a massive disruption. Uh, this shows the negative impact on demand um, in the apparel industry and footwear and accessories. And so the, the general reaction for most products, I would say, is that there was a huge disruption in the data stream on the downside. Uh, so all of a except sudden- for, Except for skincare, which is because I think we're all on um, Zooms and other <laughs> um, video um, systems, so we have to make our skin look better. Exactly, Zoom can only do so much. Uh, <laughs> we're still buying those products. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there was a big disruption uh, in the data streams, and we want to talk about how uh, particularly time series data, but other types of data, um, how did, you know, what happened and how the companies respond. Uh, this is the, we all know the airline industry has just been uh, devastated. Um, this is industry-wide data, uh, revenue passenger uh, kilometers. And uh, if you follow the blue, but you know, we, we all wish we only had to you know, forecast at the aggregate level, but you see this nice pattern, upward trend, cyclical, or seasonal rather. And uh, you know, machine learning models, they, they look, you know, they automated machine learning could handle that, uh, that data stream until you get to 2020. And it does illustrate what many, many industries were experiencing, this, this huge drop off. Um, one, one uh, chief data officer said to me, uh, you know, our machine learning models were doing great until we had eight weeks of zero and then uh, they weren't working so well. So uh, particularly if you think about automated machine learning, when you get a disruption like many, many industries experienced, the question is how do they adapt? Can they even adapt? Um, then, but but you know, not everybody was getting hit with decreased a decreased shock. There were um, industries that experienced a, a very big uptick, and in this case, uh, you know, the most famous example, of course, of course, is this toilet paper. We've already changed our uh, inventory strategy in the cam household with regard to toilet paper, so we've learned our lesson back in spring, and uh, 
you uh, become a toilet paper warehouse, basically, you're saying. Yeah, huh? exactly. That's the strategy. <laughs> uh, this shows, this doesn't show demand directly, but what this chart shows is stockouts. And uh, if you went to uh, the grocery store back in March, and much, much of the time after that, you saw uh, empty shelves with uh, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, all those things. And, and uh, so, you know, you have the consumer goods, they're not dealing with a huge drop off. They're dealing with, oh, you know, we, we don't have the capacity to keep up. We're selling everything. And, you know, how do you distribute it? Uh, some companies were taking lines that were shut down where they were going to get rid of the, um, you know, machinery and everything. And they're bringing it back on board because the demand was so strong. So, and then it, it's not just forecasting. It's also um, what I would call, you know, my more my area of expertise is really management science. The planning, you know, lot, so much of planning depends on forecasting. So, what's the disruption to planning? And I've I've spent a fair amount of time uh, in my career doing uh, consulting and supply chain optimization. And uh, to be transparent, I never really thought much about the uh, meat and poultry supply chains. Never had a job in that particular sector. But what happened there was really interesting. Uh, so you, on the left, you see restaurant reservations. And on the right, you see retail food demand. And uh, so many people thought, well, OK, nobody's going to restaurants. Let's just get that food over to the Harris Teeters and uh, you know, drive through restaurants, and everything will be fine. Well, when you've partitioned and planned, you partition your, your production capacity and, and uh, in the supply chain, uh, where you know you don't package the same, the, you don't package food and poultry the same when it's going to a restaurant versus when it's going to Harris Teeter or Kroger. And so, there's that point in the supply chain where there was a break in the link, and you couldn't just overnight switch over that capacity, and that led to um, a lot of pain in the, in the supply chain. So it's it's forecasting in general and uh, supply chain. For example, planning heavily, heavily depends on forecasting, as do most things, uh, obviously. So um, with that, Tom, I think I'm going to switch it over to you here. Yeah, so um, obviously um, big earth-shattering changes in data. And so the question is, what happens to um, particularly predictive analytics when the data, you know, uh, those of you who work with predictive analytics know um, it's hard to get good data about the future. <laughs> so we have to use data from the past. And if the past is no longer a guide to the future, um, we're going to have a tough time doing any sort of predictive analytics. So there was, I think, a very fast um, halt put on traditional predictive analytics. and. Um, when we talk to heads of data and analytics in large companies, um, many of them said, well, it isn't that analytics overall have disappeared, but you know, over the last decade or so, we've moved more and more toward predictive analytics as opposed to simple descriptive ones. And now um, we're doing a bit of a retreat. And our executives just want to know what the heck is happening in the world, um, they'd be perfectly happy right now if we could get um, good data about the present and the recent past. And so there was a shift back toward descriptive analytics with as fast uh, sort of a refresh, a low, as low a latency time as possible so they could see exactly what was going on. And then a part of descriptive analytics has always been um, exception reports. Um, what did we think was going to happen and what really happened and how much of a difference was there between those two? And uh, the exceptions were uh, rather large, as you might imagine, in this particular period. Um, and I think um, this is not just the past. You know, when Jeff was going through the, the um, uh, toilet paper stock out statistics, for example, I saw just this morning on the news that a number of 
uh, grocery retailers are having the same problem over and over again. Now, we may never figure out what is the consumer psychology that says, you know, we have to really stock up on toilet paper when, whenever there's a, a pandemic. But um, in any case, it seems to be happening all over again, and the problem has not gone away. Um, so next, next page, please, Jeff. So um, we have another poll about what your AI or analytics group has done um, during the pandemic. How have you changed um, your approaches? Um, has there been less demand for analytics overall from the organization? Um, the one that we just described, a focus on descriptive analytics rather than predictive models, um, using new types of data um, to try to shed some light on the situation, using some new model types and algorithms, um, or something else, or no, no changes at all. If you could pick one of those, we'd appreciate it. We found in another paper um, that um, um, Jeff and I and, a, and another co-author wrote in Sloan Management Review um, that there was some decrease in um, hiring of analytics people um, during the early parts of the pandemic. Um, what was the name of that article, Jeff? I actually pulled it. Uh, uh, it was, the recession was in the title. So it yeah, was, recession's impact on data science or something like that, I think. That, that um, sounds right, yeah. So um, it looks like the trend that we just described has been um, seen in your organization as well. The focus on descriptive analytics rather than predictive models is the, the modal category here, um, with about a third of you saying that that's true. Only 4% said there was less demand for analytics overall from the organization. So you, you or your analytics um, group must be doing a good job producing return on investment because we, when in that previous paper, um, we found that was the key to whether you'd have um, continuing demand or not so much. Um, some uh, people saying use of new types of data, just about a quarter and um, uh, I guess about a little more than a sixth, one sixth thing, use of new model types. So does that surprise you, Jeff, at all? No, that I think that's what I would have expected. Um, you know, there is this, uh, I think in, in the previous paper, part of what we saw was that uh, sentiment that um, when things get tough, sometimes demand for analytics actually increases. And so when you go, you know, if a company goes into cost cutting mode, they want to do that in a smart way. Uh, and so it, generally, I would say in these kind of disruptive times, analytics and data science probably are stable or maybe their demand even increases a little bit. Particularly for, you know, well-established groups. Um, exactly. And you know, I think it's fair to say that throughout this webinar and in the, in the research that we've done, there are two um, major factors driving these changes. One is um, COVID related data and analytics, and the other is economic impacts of COVID-related data and analytics. And the two obviously are, are um, sort of correlated, if you will, but they are um, different types of data. Um, next slide, please. Um, so how have um, analytics and AI groups rebooted during the pandemic? A variety of ways. Um, one is thinking about what data is still relevant. Uh, do we, we have some types of, of data or some um, uh, instances of data that we need to get rid of, what to keep, what to impute based on um, you know, our limited ability to do that now. More use of external data to try to figure out what's going on, particularly with regard to things like demand and consumer behavior. We'll talk more about um, all of these. Um, some business analytics professionals have had to almost become epidemiologists um, studying things like um, cases and deaths of COVID and the implications of those for businesses. We'll talk about that. 
um, ramping up the processes of model auditing and stress testing to see, you know, can we really rely on these for making decisions? Um, um, some organizations have constructed portfolios of specialized models just for periods like this. Um, some have used combinations of models and ensembles, and some are focusing on um, scenario models that might give some understanding and even prediction of what's going to happen in the in the near future. Yeah, so uh, data relevancy is sort of the fundamental question, I think, here. So if you think about time series and automated machine learning, uh, the question is, does you, do your models react quickly enough? And this, this is just a simple uh, series, a set rather, of uh, different period moving averages uh, just to illustrate you know, what we're talking about here. You can react quickly. So on the light blue, you see last period and the orange is a 10 period moving average. You know, one of the one of the impacts of this pandemic is I think the general public now understands moving averages because every chart uh, to see on the news has moving averages. But uh, what this kind of illustrates is some of what we heard from uh, the executives we spoke to in the spring, which is to say, when things really shift, you start to rely on very simple descriptive analytics, and in this case, the the simplest predictive model is what happened yesterday, that's what we're going to use to predict what, what's going to happen today. And so, um, you know, a one, if you, if you think about last period, that's what the da light uh, dashed line is. Uh, that's what a lot of companies did. They said, okay, we're going to hit the stop button on all machine learning models, and we're going to try to figure out what's relevant. And right now, things are so different from what they were uh, we're just going to look and see, you know, what happened yesterday. What kind of demand do we have yesterday? And that's going to be guiding us forward. And so a, a larger question is, do you just throw out all of that previous data and start from scratch? Do you um, somehow, you know, combine other things? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But where do you go for help? predicting when you, you know, you thought you were doing pretty well and you were cruising along with your machine learning and now uh, there's no way it's going to adapt on its own. So companies hit the stop button and uh, try to figure out what was going on. So one place to turn is here. I'll let Tom take this one. Yeah, so um, companies were quite interested in anything they could figure out. Um, a lot of their internal data um, had changed and was no longer a good uh, predictor of what might happen in the future. So they started to look externally. And um, one uh, type of data, of course, is what's actually happening in the pandemic um, in terms of um, you know, how will it impact my operations. In order to do that, you have to get very localized and look at cases and deaths and hospitalizations and so on, and even policies. Um, you know, uh, the in the United States, there have been widely varying policies across states and um, certain with regard to masks and lockdown policies and so on. So if you're going to try to do any prediction of what might happen in the near future with COVID, it's important to be able to classify what the policies are. Um, China, of course, um, uh, was where this virus originated. There was a very strong lockdown there for a while. A lot of company supply chains originate in China. So there was a real um, interest in what was happening in China operations. Um, one of the automobile companies that we spoke with, I think um, we got approval to mention them, Jeff, is that Ford said that um, Yep. They were trying to figure out how much actual driving was taking place, looking at things like smog levels um, in certain cities. Um, it's still the case, maybe not as much as it was before, that more driving equals more smog. And more driving also indicates that you know the economy is getting back to normal and people might want to buy cars again. Um, uh, companies were interested in movement through ports. Um, if a port shuts down, obviously, you know, you can't unload ships and you can't um, 
um, get your products to sell. And I think just a general interest in consumer confidence levels. Um, interestingly, I think those have started to come back up more quickly um, than we might have expected, which is maybe a good sign. It'll be interesting to see do those go down if we have further lockdowns because of the current spike in the in the United States. So some of the um, business analytics people that we have talked to, I did a separate project looking at this and a study that hasn't been published yet, um, were really asked to become epidemiologists of sorts and um, asked to predict the impact of COVID-19 on the business in various ways. And in order to do that, you have to sort of predict what's going to happen with COVID-19, a typical activity of an epidemiologist. Um, they were somewhat hindered in this activity by the really bad data that we have for COVID-19 in the United States. Some other countries, I think, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore have done a much better job of it than we have. Um, we have um, widely varying approaches to um, classifying and reporting cases. We can't even agree on what's a COVID-related death. Um, one life insurance company's analytics group was asked to predict, well, are we going to have to have lots of payouts because of uh, deaths um, for insured people for COVID more than we normally would from um, total causes of death? The answer, of course, was yes. Um, but that group found that cases were really useless as a predictor because a, they're highly influenced by how much testing is going on, and B, um, there's a widespread variance in how cases are reported across um, states and even cities in some cases. So um, uh, another um, analytics group, this was um, a um, company that I do some work with called First Analytics, was asked by their um, uh, one of their clients in the animal health business to help them think about what are the, the impacts on meatpacking plants? Because if a meatpacking plant shuts down, and apparently being in a meatpacking plant is not a great thing to be during a pandemic because a lot of people have um, caught the disease, the, the virus there, and um, you know working conditions seem to facilitate it. Meatpacking plant co closes down, that means that um, people raising livestock can't send their their cattle there and to be processed, and that means that um, uh, they won't be able to um, plan very effectively on you know how much to feed them and so on. So the animal health company said maybe we can provide some insights to them, and they did using detailed data about what was happening in the counties where those meatpacking plants were located. Um, uh, another company was very interested in worker shortages. This was a transportation company. Are we gonna be able to find enough people to operate our transportation network? Again, you have to look in those hub areas. Um, another consumer products company turned to First Analytics and said, um, okay, we'd like to know, is it safe to send our, our salespeople into grocery stores? Um, and so, again, you look at very detailed data and make predictions, and they classified each store as green, it's safe to go in, yellow, you know, be very careful, red, don't go there. Um, but interestingly enough, some of the corporate legal people in the organization said, and eh, we're not sure we want to issue these recommendations to our people. It's not that we don't trust them, but if they go into a a uh, store we classified as green and catch the virus, then um, you know maybe we'll get sued or something. So um, they just said, don't visit any stores. Um, it does, this whole um, set of issues does change, I think, how we view uh, the reliability and the usefulness of, of analytics like this. We also heard from uh, some of the folks we talked to about an increase in model auditing and stress testing. So uh, Tom already talked about exception reports. So you know, you're running your machine learning models and all of a sudden 
these reports that maybe used to used to run uh, you know once a month now you're running them multiple times a week because you don't trust that your models are going to stay under control and this is this could lead to um, this I uh, you know a, a stronger sense of the need for model quality control you know for for years we've been doing quality control on manufacturing and when you know a line gets out of control it, it, it bounces so many data points appear outside the control limits you stop the machine well that that same thing is probably going to have to be uh, used on our machine learning models that same notion that as things start to get out of control where you know the the errors that we're seeing exceed our control limits that perhaps automatically the auto, automated machine learning stops and uh, the other thing we were hearing was increased stress testing of our forecasting and planning models and uh, you know we saw that this kind of notion also I think came about back during the financial crisis in the previous recession uh, sort of the, the idea of a black swan event and how do you take that into account um, when you model we're seeing more calls for that now. For example, you know, I mentioned before supply chain. Uh, David Semke Levy at uh, MIT uh, had an article not long ago about just just like we require stress testing for banks models, uh, might we see the same thing for supply chain because of how disruption uh, creeps into society from supply chain. So. I think we're going to see more of that. I don't know that if we'll see regulation like we've seen uh, in the banking industry, but uh, stress testing is definitely becoming more important. It's a matter of risk mitigation. Uh, some companies talked about uh, pulling models off the shelf that they developed for other uh, special events, let's call them. So uh, one consumer goods uh, company talked about well, we, we went and we pulled our hurricane planning models off, off the shelf. So a hurricane planning model meant, you know, there's going to be a hurricane in Alabama on the coast, and we would uh, make changes in our supply chain in terms of supplying goods uh, to that area of the country. And you have to answer questions like, you know, uh, how broad reaching is that hurricane going to be? How, you know, what set of stores, what set of distribution centers? have to receive extra goods, that same kind of thing might be transferable to the pandemic as, a, as the pandemic spreads. Uh, others talked about recession models uh, and certainly any kind of disruption. So merger, on, merger and acquisition models, those are very disruptive to business operations, although they don't, they don't hit you know, so dramatically and quickly like uh, the pandemic did. But the general idea here is we have developed specialized models you know, is there anything we can learn from those models that would in any way be applicable to uh, the pandemic, the situation we're in now? Another uh, thing that has been mentioned, and it's been in the news lately, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Weekend Wall Street Journal um, is what led me to this website, COVID-19 Forecast Hub. And uh, in the context of the, of the Wall Street Journal article, it was about, you know, uh, what are the best models for, for predicting COVID deaths in the U.S.? And it turns out, uh, according to the article, that the best uh, predictor of deaths in the U.S. is actually an ensemble model. And if you're not familiar with that, an ensemble model is really an aggregation of a bunch of other models. So in this case, you know, we don't know a whole lot about how to model COVID, but there are something like 40 models out there. They all make different assumptions. And so what they do at this forecast hub is they take these 40 models and uh, they aggregate them in a way that results in a single forecast based on all of those models. So, you know, for the sake of argument, you know, take the median forecast, for example. So what you see on the right panel is somehow um, a statistical uh, measurement of all the 40 models on the left. And so you, this, is, this is valuable when you're in uncharted water. I mean, you, you have to make it, in the absence of data, you can still build models, but you have to assume the parameters of the model. And so how do you, how do you still make that useful? What you can do is use uh, 
ensemble models and hope that you're not um, you know, too far off. Uh, finally, there's uh, scenario models. And so anytime there's uncertainty, you see an increase in call, calls for scenario models. And um, this little graphic here, just to, to illustrate, if you're not that familiar, I'm going to talk about a planning model here. So this is a just a toy uh, production planning problem where you have stock out costs and uh, capacity. And what I did was I simulated 100 demand streams. And then I optimized, you know, I said, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I have 100 possibilities and I optimized every one of them. So the red dot um, gives you uh, the average cost of a plan that was optimized for that scenario when I run that, that solution through all 100 scenarios. So I solved the problem as if each one of these 100 instances is the actual, and I plugged each of the 100 answers into the simulation. And so you see a high cost, a low cost, and then the dots are really the average cost. So I'm not showing the distribution of cost here, it's just the high, low, and average. But in the middle of the slide, you see a, a yellow dot. Um, that looks like a pretty good solution if I'm trying to hedge because it has low variance and a relatively low dot average cost. But what you really should be doing, which I haven't illustrated here, is you should be putting these 100 scenarios into one model and optimize that for, you know, you could optimize value at risk. You could um, uh, optim you know, find the solution that gives me the best worst case over all the scenarios. So those are hedging models. And uh, when, when we say scenario models, that's really what it comes down to. How do I hedge against the uncertainty to some extent um, become more conservative in my planning to avoid downside risk? Uh, so we're seeing an increase in the call for scenario models. And, and then uh, this is our, our last slide. Moving forward, uh, we we already talked about this, that in, in a sense, um, the spring was um, our first try at this. And now, unfortunately, as Tom said, we're facing what looks like a second round of this. It could be even worse. And can we be better prepared uh, with analytics and data science as we head into um, this winter? So Tom, anything to add with this last slide? No, it's a sober note <laughs> to end yeah. upon, but I think it, it does suggest that um, we still need to keep working on these issues. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, that, was, that was great. And we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so I'm glad we still have a good amount of time left for Q&A. So uh, my first question for you is, um, oh, I'll pop back to my questions. Um, I guess, Tom, I'll ask you, uh, which of, of the changes in analytics and data science from the pandemic do you think is most likely to be permanent? Uh, well, I would probably pick the use of external data, which was happening more and more already. And, you know, the use of external data, for example, to predict demand, I think is a very useful um, thing to do, and um, uh, the COVID, I think, is just accelerating that that trend. So I hope that it continues. So, you know, one of the big problems that we've had with data and analytics in a lot of um, organizations is they've been too internally focused. So um, switching to figuring out what's going on in the outside world, people who aren't our customers. Uh, uh, what people think about us, what's happening with our suppliers and their suppliers and so on, you know, all, all good things to do. Yeah, well, well to, that, um, to that point, um, there were a few questions about the, about external data. Um, one of my, did you, have you seen uh, sort of lasting, any new re increased relationships of data sharing amongst uh, partners in supply chains or just sort of within business ecosystems? Did you see an increase in that as people were looking for more sources of data, aside from the other external sources that you covered in your slide? Yeah, I think, well, the, the obvious one was that uh, a lot of companies were going to the Johns Hopkins 
website <laughs> where the COVID data, you know, probably the most popular COVID site. Um, and then others, I, I, I don't know, Tom, if you agree, most of the companies that I remember talking to about this, they were going after more publicly available data than say going to another uh, company and, and trying to collaborate. I don't know, would you agree with that, Tom? Yeah, I think there are more and more publicly available data sources, either you know for free or um, uh, for uh, pay. And um, so, yeah, I think organizations are seeking those out. And you know, it was an interesting thing um, uh, what you were saying about the Johns Hopkins site. Um, you know, I think we probably, and my own view is that. Um, we should have centralized the data in a government agency more and you know hopkins and the university of washington side and mit had one of these two could have focused on the analytics for it rather than having multiple definitions of the truth about what's just happening with the um, basic levels of the virus and deaths and ppe and so on so um uh, I, I think my message would have been centralize the data, decentralize the analytics, but since we didn't really have good centralized data, um, lots of sources, the New York Times, the uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, the Atlantic Monthly, uh, all these somewhat unlikely places had, had um, data available on what's happening in COVID. Yeah, I, think, I think the other, to piggyback on what Tom said, I, I would have said the same thing in terms of external data going forward, uh, an emphasis on that. The other thing we heard was agility, and it's related to external data. So uh, the need to be more agile and what, what at least one person I talked to meant by that was, we use Johns Hopkins again, if I go to get the Johns Hopkins data, how much red tape do I have to go through to bring that into my corporation and use it in models? And if there's a lot of red tape there, you're not going to be agile. And so there's, those two things are related, agility and the ability to bring external data in and use it right away. You know, or do you have this long process before you're allowed to use external data to begin with? That's going to be a detriment if that's the case. Well, and speaking of agility, the Hopkins people themselves were very agile. Apparently, they developed that website in one night. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, it's quite astounding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question here about about data. Uh, our uh, audience member writes: less data means algorithms won't won't learn as fast. Um, but could that also introduce bias into lessons learned and introduce inaccuracies in subsequent forecasts? I'll I'll read the whole question in case that helps elucidate. Uh, machine learning is always based on what has already happened, right? So how does it deal with a reality in which important patterns are likely to change in unpredictable nonlinear ways? Yeah. Well, what is that you just don't do as much of it um, uh, when, when past data is not a guide to you know, um, the future. Um, and it, you know, this is not the first time we saw this. It happened during the last um, a big economic crisis when, uh, for example, the um, uh, number of people who uh, were supposedly going to to repay their mortgages turned out not to be a very good guide to whether that was actually happening. And a number of banks had huge problems as a result, in part because of changes in, you know, verification of income and and so on. So um, uh, this is not the first rodeo. And what we need to do is figure out when um, current data or past data are no longer a good guide and just stop using those models. I think there's a tendency to sort of once they're running to let them go on autopilot. But um, the world changes and we have to change our modeling approaches with them. Yeah, and I would, I would, I would go back to again external data. If we're seeing an increase in the need for external data, and uh, the person asking the question asks it about bias, then you better choose your external data carefully, right? Uh, you have to really think about what you're bringing into your models. Um, 
anytime you're just trying to decide what what gets thrown into the hopper to be considered by a model there's that there's that chance for bias right well and actually i've got there are two questions which are different but they're both follow-ups to <laughs> things that you both said um i'll 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 follow up first with you jeff uh, so just because you, you just raised the, that point um how uh any tips, uh, our question winners, are there tips on how to handle data that might be skewed for political reasons, um, such as data related oh, to COVID? That could, I'm sorry, that could never happen. Uh, I think we can move to the next question. <laughs> uh, but, but really, you know, given um, how much controversy there's, there's been over, you know, what, you know, truth data, um, how do people, uh, yeah, really. And, and any tips on on, uh, on evaluating those sources and um... right. So, so I guess the question is, how do you avoid politicized data? Yeah, probably be the best way. Well, so basically, uh, to avoid it would be the tip if you think it's politicized. Right. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, it's almost. I mean, I don't think it's. Uh, we're looking for a statistical test. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> a statistical test to determine if it's politically biased. It depends on the data, I guess. But um, I guess you, you know, what, what's the 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 uh, advantage? Consider the source. I guess I don't know. That maybe that's the best you can do. Right. Is consider the source. Um, okay. Well, um, and, yeah. and I think it it does mean that in public health data, we need to establish some um, processes to prevent that kind of politicization. You know, um, there occasionally um, in um, unemployment data, for example, there will be charges that a particular presidential administration is manipulating unemployment data, but economists generally speak up and say there's no way that could happen. There are enough um, processes in place and enough controls so that we can depend on unemployment data. But turns out we could not depend on COVID data. You know, I'm in Florida right now, and our governor was actively suppressing um, bad news. And the, the woman who was working for the state to produce the dashboard resigned in protest and developed her own dashboard of more accurate data. So we we shouldn't let um, politicians screw around with public health data. It's a recipe for disaster, and it's one of the reasons why we have the disaster that we do in this country. Okay. Agreed. And then um, and then this was the other one that was sort of a follow up from a long ago point that you made, Tom, in the last question. But uh, you know about the, the again about data. Will we end up eliminating data collected during the pandemic? as an outlier for machine learning models, do you think, going forward? Well, I, I think as Jeff was suggesting for that consumer products company who had some hurricane-oriented models, I think it's, you know, A, there will be further pandemics, B, there will be natural disasters of other types, and so I don't think you should throw that data away but you should uh, put the data and the resulting models on the shelf and say, okay, when something something bad like this happens, um, uh, you know, let's bring them out again. What isn't, um, I think Walmart is famous for doing that with regard to its supply chain and restocking levels and so on. Jeff, you probably know more about that than I do, but um, yeah, this is, this is not a one-time event, sadly. Right. right. Walmart plays close, close attention to weather data. Yeah, they're pretty sophisticated, actually. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, and again, you you know you talked about stress testing um, during the presentation. Um, one of our uh, viewers wants to know what are other applications of machine learning and data analytics for enterprise risk management. And I'm curious if you think you'll see more of that going forward. Hmm. Uh, Tom's interacted with some financial institutions. Um, in, in my experience, yeah, those are usually um, about things like you know uh, fraud and any money laundering and so on. And machine learning is increasingly 
use for those kinds of activities. You know, you think about um, uh, any money laundering, which every bank has to do now, that was in the past a kind of a rule-based approach. And um, it had one big disadvantage um, in that it produced way too many false positives uh, for some banks, you know, 90 five ninety eight percent false positives so um, the most sophisticated banks are now starting to use um, machine learning to take those positive outcomes of the rule-based system which they have to use because regulators insist upon them and kind of rank them score them so you can see which ones really need the most attention and um, for many of them unless something else bad happens you can kind of um, put them aside and chances are pretty good the problem will, will go away. So that's one approach to enterprise risk management using machine learning. Okay. Now, I think I think another obvious, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're very far along yet, but another obvious place is in healthcare itself. So healthcare analytics, when you saw the stress that was on the system in New York in the spring, for example, uh, we're going to see an increase in the use of analytics in healthcare to, to better, just better manage the system, and a lot of that is going to be uh, stress, you know, stress testing kind of planning. Right. Okay. But I, I think it's important to point out also that um, machine learning was not terribly helpful um, for figuring out how to treat this pandemic. Um, there was some early action to identify it by this company Blue Dot in um, in Canada, um, based on you know news reports and so on coming out of out of China. But in general, you know this this is not called a novel coronavirus for nothing. And when we don't know what's worked well in the past, we can't really use machine learning or other forms of AI to do a great job of recommending treatment approaches. So. Um, it's rather unfortunate. Maybe in the next pandemic, we'll we'll be able to do that better. And uh, another viewer raises uh, another kind of existential threat: <laughs> um, climate change. How are companies building predictive models for climate change, given that the pandemic was always theoretically well understood, but not something that business factored in? Um, do you think, uh, uh, maybe I'll broaden this question out and say, um, do you see an interest or willingness among uh, the analytics uh, leaders that you speak to, to um, broadening out their, uh, I guess, predictive analytics to include some of these wider risks in their scenarios? Certainly, even like the military, is doing a lot of analysis with regard to climate change and the risk it poses. Um, so there, there's been a lot of discussion around that. I haven't heard a lot, maybe Tom has, but I haven't heard a lot from companies on climate change other than they know people care about it and consequently they feel a responsibility to say, uh, minimize their carbon footprint, right? Um, Tom, I don't know if you've heard more, had more conversations than I've had on that. Well, I, I think there are, people are starting to use machine learning a fair amount for um, energy, uh, optimizing energy consumption. Uh, Google has a famous um, uh, approach using some of their deep mind algorithms for reducing energy consumption in their data centers. Um, I was talking the other day to a uh, um, uh, imaging startup, uh, um, imaging from the air, typically from drones and so on, that can look at different um, um, tillage approaches in agriculture and determine, you know, what are the climate change, uh, in the you know, the carbon reduction implications for different um, approaches to tillage. So. Um, I think we're starting, as Jeff says. I don't think we're terribly far along. Sadly, the um, you know the overall time series data um, says that a there's little or no doubt that we have a huge problem, and b that we're not really addressing the problem fast enough. And 
And then uh, here's a question that's uh, you know maybe specific to, to real estate, in the, but I, but it, it probably broader as well. Um, he, he writes that volume, real estate volume and prices have essentially decoupled from unemployment and other economic time series. Um, can you comment on ways to handle that in future forecasting and how to know when relationships have come back to normal? And I think that last piece could you know, possibly be, apply in a lot of other circumstances as well, where we've seen the pandemic sort of decouple um, other relationships that we're used to seeing in data. And how can we, how will we know when those relationships sort of reassert themselves, I guess? Oh. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Um, I mean, basically, don't Jeff, you're, you're more of a machine learning guy than I am, but you're you basically just keep trying new models based on past data, and when they um, predict well again, uh, then you say, okay, um, things must be returning to normal, or at least. Um, I have now an ability, maybe I've found some other data that are um, good, uh, other features that are good predictors of the outcome I'm trying to predict, but you just keep on trying to um, model that data and see what fits and stops, you know, drifting all the time. Okay. We have time for one more quick question. Um, how do you see the pandemic affecting hiring in this field? All right. Um, I, I track some data in um, a software called Burning Glass. Burning Glass Technologies is the company. And um, there, what we saw in April and May was, uh, if you remember the, uh, the airline slide that I had where the miles went straight down, that, that happened a little bit with data science and analytics. Uh, we saw this trend where it was going up for both uh, data science and analytics, and then there was this drop in May. And oddly, even as soon as the end of June, uh, this is new postings, new job postings, uh, analytics was sort of back up to where it was before the pandemic drop occurred. Um, but, and, and it, it it seems to have stabilized. I haven't I haven't gotten data recently from Burning Glass like it since you know the end of summer, but I was shocked at how quickly new job ads and analytics. Analytics is a broader term than data science, but it it bounced back very fast in early summer. Um, but I don't I don't know why. I don't know if it goes back to increased demand like we talked about when things get tough, or I don't know. Tom, you have. Well, yeah, more anecdotally, I would say we saw this in some of the, the data that you're talking about too, highly industry dependent. So um, anything related to travel or entertainment, uh, somebody was telling me recently that StubHub got rid of almost all of its analytics oriented people, not too surprising, you know, nobody's buying tickets to um, athletic or entertainment events anymore. Um, but in general, you know, I think it's still a good field to be in and um, hiring in more prosperous industries has made up um, for um, some of the downturns we've seen in, in the industries that are really hard hit. Yeah, and some of it is small business, big business too. I was talking to someone last week in uh, automobile industry and that person had multiple openings. Uh, in his group, so. Good. Well, I think we're almost at the top of the hour, so uh, we should uh, draw a line under the Q&A. That's all the time we have. Um, thank you both so much, and uh, I'd like to last one last thanks to our sponsor, SAS Playa. Again, thanks all for joining us today.